And this week, we're really excited to have Andrew Brown with us. Andrew is co-founder of Brown & Brown Architects, who are based in Strathdon, Aberdeenshire. Brown & Brown explores contemporary interpretations of vernacular Scottish architecture and sees context and perspective as crucial to the design and siting of the buildings. Andrew is an invited critic and guest lecturer of several UK schools of architecture and has taught at both undergraduate and postgraduate level. Andrew is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. So I'll just pass over to you, Andrew, to start your talk. Thank you. Hello, thanks very much for asking us to speak. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our practice and some of the things that interest us. Uh, I'll endeavour for it not to go on too long. It's also not just going to be a slideshow of our work, which I find slightly, slightly cringy. So the main thing I'm interested in is storytelling. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, we all know how the what's going to happen with the world. Everyone's going to die and everyone we love is going to die and then everything in the universe will die. And how do you, if you arrive at a very rational position of believing that you can't function knowing that, then society would say that you were broken in some way. So how do humans kind of function knowing that? And the answer is stories. You know, what do we want? What do we like? What do we want to do with our lives? You know, stories are the distractions that turn our existence away from this dread. You know, so to start off on a story, I suppose we're a small practice, deliberately so. You know, we're based in the north of Scotland. We work across the UK uh, from Orkney down to kind of Somerset at the moment. And even in that description, there's hints of a story. The use of the word small mentioned that we're based in the north. They're all attempts to make people think, you know, what we want them to. So we're a small family firm started by Kate and I. You know, we uh, have an almost non-corporate culture, I suppose. A practice that fits with our way of life. You know, we have a live work balance. That means things like flexi time. I mean, I start work at 6 a.m. most days, you know, and that allows me to finish earlier, which allows me to collect my daughter from school. And I think these kind of things and empathy that goes along with understanding life outside of practice is what allows us to relate better to clients that are uh, domestic. So this is our studio uh, in, out in Stratton, which is at the east end of the Cairngorms National Park. Uh, we closed our office in Aberdeen just before the pandemic and moved to this little studio that we've built uh, just kind of along the valley from uh, where Kate and I live, which means a, a bit of a commute for other people rather than us. And again, that kind of helps us you know, kind of relate to what clients are looking for when it comes to a house and things as well, that they can see that we're living a kind of live work balance, which I think always helps. Yeah, so we're definitely not kind of interested in that kind of conveyor belt of increasing project size, you know, that practices get into. I mean, we don't see that as a kind of positive evolution. For us, it's more kind of about the right kind of projects, which ultimately boils down to the right kind of clients. You know, so we would rather do the wrong job, but for the right client, you know, which is something that we've learned. That kind of leads us on to kind of narrow casting which is a slightly marketing uh, pretentious phrase, but uh, it's a kind of perceived lack of ambition. I was speaking to an architectural photographer recently who was talking about another firm who said, uh, oh, you would think that they would be doing something more than houses by now, you know, which, which I couldn't agree with less, really. You know, it's, I think that there's that kind of thing that you get on to this kind of conveyor belt of, if you prove yourself at domestic work, you do small-scale public. If you move yourself, prove yourself at small-scale public, you do larger-scale public, and you work your way up the ladder. And we don't really see that as how we want to have a practice. You know, we, we do projects for clients that we genuinely want to undertake. You know, it's not just about uh, keeping the wheels from the door and putting food on the table. So that, that compulsion to be drawn onto that kind of project's ladder yeah, you know, it maybe comes from education, you know, where you get a more complicated brief as you go through the years, but it's not something that we uh, kind of buy into and it doesn't kind of chime with how we want to run our practice. You know, so a perfect example is a, a project we did a number of years ago, which is a boat building centre up in Port, Port Soy, uh, which was very well received. I mean, it won the Best Culture Building at the Scottish Design Awards, that kind of thing, but it actually showed us the type of project that we didn't want to do. Uh, I mean that with all due respect to the clients and the, you know, the, the end users were a group. And then from that, there was an appointed body that was the client. So you don't have direct access to the people who are going to use your building to, you know, to every one of them. 
And I think we found that that we didn't enjoy that as much, you know, and that it wasn't as it didn't give us the same scope of involvement, you know. So we'll talk a little bit about storytelling, you know, in the context of our work in architecture in general, which I think is something that's really important, you know. So it's something that all architects are trained to do and to an extent do instinctively, you know. So I'm not trying to teach grandma to suck eggs with about it, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it both in and outside of architecture. You know, so it's really about curiosity. Uh, you know, so between the ages of two and five, you know, children are going to ask 40,000 uh, questions on average, you know, so and babies and things are, are drawn in blind tests to uh, images they've never seen before because they're curious, you know. So I guess it's those gaps in information that drive curiosity. You know, so that's a, a still from one of my favourite films, Lost in Translation, you know, where you don't actually know what the two main characters say to each other at the end, you know, and it's it brings you back to it over and over again. And, you know, because I think you have that desire to fill in the void, you know, the, the information gap. And I think for me, everyone favours a different kind of style of storytelling. For, for me, I, you know, I love Hemingway, you know, I think because it's, it's brilliantly descriptive, it's evocative, but it's very succinct, you know, so... My favourite book's For Whom the Bell Tolls, but I, mean, I also love The Old Man in the Sea. It's a story about something that seems so small. It's about a, a man going fishing. You know, but it encapsulates everything that matters about the life of a person within that, you know. So as with a, quite a lot of Hemingway books, you know, the the first sentence, the last sentence invokes the first sentence, you know, which creates a kind of symmetry, you know, which is suggestive, but at the same time deliberately is not explicitly descriptive of everything that kind of passes between them. So, and again, it's that kind of thing of that involuntary induction of curiosity. You know, I think the idea of if you pose a question or if you have an, a sequence of events, but someone doesn't know how it ends. So, yeah, you know, the, the idea that someone else knows something that you don't. I think that those things all garner uh, a kind of feeling of curiosity. And I think those are things that you see drive clients, you know, that clients are excited to see what comes next. You know, what is it that you already know that they don't know? You know, what are you going to show them that they don't know about? You know, and I think that that becomes part of the fun for us and perhaps it's part of the reason that we really like working with clients who are not professional clients. You know, they're not uh, boards of people who commission, you know, 10 projects a year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about non-architectural examples of storytelling. You know, so that is an image by a, a guy called Alex McBride, who's a, a war photographer. And uh, I watched a lecture that he gave uh, earlier this year to Laika, uh, the Laika University, about uh, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. You know, he was sitting in his living room and he heard on Al Jazeera that a war had broken out. So, you know, he grabbed his bag and he was at the airport, you know, with his credentials in a few hours. And it's that idea that, you know, he, they're not always aesthetically beautiful photographs, although that one is. You know, but it's it gives the viewer a piece of information and communicates something to them. You know, who is the soldier? You know, has he lost someone? Is he paying for protection? Your mind starts to fill in you know, what happened to the church. Your mind starts to fill in the gaps. You know, and I think that's something that's always interested me in a way. It's, it's the way that you can interpret, you know, kind of uh, photographs or pieces of visual information. I mean, Todd Hedo, who's a famous American photographer, you know, has this kind of range of photographs at night and they never have the human form in them so that the viewer can always place their own narrative on it. You know, so many people tell them that the images remind them of something from their own past, even if they've never been in a place and they've never visited it. And I think it's because there's human elements within it that we can all relate to, but that the human is removed from all of the images. And to continue the... The, the kind of talking about kind of storytelling. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll go back and not play that quite yet. Is uh, there's a, a chap called Roger Deakins who, who is a kind of master of cinematography, and everyone has seen Roger Deakins' films and doesn't know about it. You know, so I'm going to play a short clip from 1917. You know, which is it's actually not a genre I'm a big fan of, but it tells the story so well in one shot, it leaves you breathless and it kind of draws you in. You know, so I'm just going to play it, it's just a minute or so long, and then we can have a chat about it after.
So, I mean, for those of you who don't know, 1917 is, is told as one shot, uh, it's one scene, so there, there's no breaks in it, you know, so it leaves you quite breathless the way it runs through it. You know, but in that end scene, there's so many layers of storytelling, you know, from the loss of the soldier to the calm after everything the main character's been through to the photograph. And then the moment that you realise that the director, Sam Mendes, who is telling us the story, has a personal link to the events and he credits the person who then told him the stories that led to him making the film. And I think the thing about those kind of layers as they're unveiled to you is it never, it never ceases to have an impact on me that really, you know, so... And that kind of lead, I mean, leads into my biggest interest outside of architecture, which undeniably influences our work, is about visual storytelling and photography. You know, and great kind of visual storytellers like Tish Mutha or Steve McCurry, you know, they tell stories about people, you know, and it's, I think that that's what allows you to contextualise yourself against them. So what I thought I would do is just quickly show a couple of little things that a little photo stories uh, about things that kind of happen outside of practice and then, and then obviously, you know, in, in our own life and influence our work. You know, so I've got a kind of uh, an experienced photographer who's like a kind of mentor guy of mine that he uh, wanted me to kind of set me the kind of task of telling him little stories you know, during the lockdown. You know, so I started uh, learning how to tell them and it's not about good photographs, for example, it's about the story that they tell, you know. So this one is about the fact that you know, during COVID, I start work at 6 a.m. You know, I walk out to the office. You know, last winter we had four months where we had uh, about a metre and a half of snow lying. You know, so I walk out to work and it's that thing that the office is, you're not really aware of anything further than it in the landscape. There's no other lights visible at that time normally. So I, I can turn the lights on remotely as I walk out to it and you just see a kind of shot into the meeting table, which is what I see as I walk out to the office. You know, and it's cold. I mean, the, the heating's actually broken in the office just now. I just uh, came back to find out, which is why I'm sitting shivering. But I mean, our office is heated by, by the sunlight, really, you know, and a stove. And there's a, there's a heating system that only gets turned on for two months of the year, really, you know. So at 6 a.m., the space needs a little bit of heating. And then everyone's working at home because of COVID, you know. So the thing is that, you know, I'm here in the office working in isolation. You know, it's taking a toll on everyone, obviously, COVID, but for us, it was this, we had this idea of making this studio space that we could all work together. And then it's become my personal space in a way, you know, for the last 18 months, you know. So th th this is like a day in the life, really, for us. But at the same at the same time, you know, my wife Kate's drawing the short straw and she works more flexibly than I am. So I finish mid-afternoon and take over homeschooling, but she does homeschooling before that. You know, so this, this is her daughter. Uh, this is Kate after she's... Done the, done the homeschooling. And then the idea is that, you know, we've got a young child, she's alone in a valley, you know, she's cut off from social interaction, you know, like because of COVID. She's experiencing the world in near isolation and everything that that, you know, brings with it. You know, everything in our Glen, you know, seemed paused last winter. Everything was like it was waiting for the world to begin. You know, and we would both play, you know, in the snow with her once we'd finished work and, you know, hard days would end. You know, colouring in with their feet in warm water, you know, and our, day, our days would end, you know, in a different way, you know. So, and then the the kind of, well, I'm going to show you three different little uh, projects, but the photographer asked me to tell a little story about our dog, you know, like, so our, our dog Harry is old and grumpy, you know, and he was our original architectural assistant, you know, he's quite a personality, etc. You know, anyone that has a pet understands, you know. Then as he got older, you know, we found out he had a degenerative spine condition, which led on to lots of other conditions, you know. And you know, he loved gingerbread men, you know, and, and Kate used to bake him gingerbread men to give them, uh, Kate and, and her daughter Freya. And then as you can see from his arms there, you know, things weren't good at this at this point, and that's actually his last meal. You know, Kate was giving him homemade gingerbread at that point before the vet or friend came to see us. You know, so... And then suddenly you, you have a big part of your life, you know, that suddenly you don't, you know, and it's gone. And it's it's the absence of presence that leaves a mark, you know, and you're left with objects that create fragments of memory. You know, and I did this little project about the dog as a warm up for something I'm intending to do about my father who passed away a couple of years ago. You know, I wanted to try and tell the story of him through photographs of the things that he left behind. 
You know, for example, our daughter asked for a scale Harry teddy to be made, wouldn't be parted with it for weeks, and that was what she wanted for Christmas. You know, and then going full circle, you know, like uh, like the old man in the sea, you know, it's the start of the story is his favourite spot where he was sitting on in a favourite picture, and it's the end. Or is it? You know, because as this is our current dog, Monty, who also likes to sit in that spot and lie on Harry's uh, rug and lie in Harry's bed. You know, so again, it's that idea of kind of cyclical storytelling in a way. And then at the moment, you know, I'm working on a photography project, hopefully for a little book, you know, that uh, I'm kind of working on for at least the next couple of years, you know, where I'm, I'm documenting the, the north coast of Aberdeenshire. And it's a contrast of the kind of tourist spots that you get there. And the contrast between that and the people who live there, and the conflicting ideas of leisure and escape and why people go there. But then that often uh, contradicts the kind of harsh aspects of everyday life for some people there. You know, so that this is Clevy, which you know, many people will know. But, you know, it's two tourist places, but I'm trying to take them empty. You know, like, like the kind of Todd Hedo thing that I, I don't want any people in them, but I want to photograph them in the summer, which is very difficult, you know. So... That's how tourists think about the sports. They think of them as places for enjoyment, not as places for people, you know. So, and it's it's kind of, but who cares about buildings by the sea? You know, we care about them because we can insert ourselves into them. You know, what would it be like to live there? How difficult was it to build? You know, this is why Todd Tito leaves his photographs empty with human form. So that you can allow the viewer to center the image around themselves. You know, for example, this is Billy's yard up at Crivy, you know, so... He's one of the few people who live at Crivy, rather than it being a holiday thing, and the objects that he collects from the sea. Um, and then, you know, I actually didn't know it, but I, I, the, the sheet in that is from someone we know that lives in Crivy, you know, and again, they, they're one of the few people that live there as well. So there's all these drying things along the front, but if tourists aren't drying their clothes, then there's very few examples of human habitation. You know, and, and Crivy has no car access. You know, you have to leave your car at the end and you push your things along to your house in a wheelbarrow, you know. So the, the harsh reality of, of living there is very different from visiting it as a tourist. You know, so the life of a local, I mean, th th this is Dan, who's someone that we know, you know. So Dan's shaped by that place. You know, he, he first went there because he works in marine conservation, you know, basically finding a way to stop the fishermen from shooting the, the seals you know, is the way he would describe his job. And then he met his wife, Catherine, there, and, and, and they live there. You know, but that idea that, you know, Dan, Dan's got a map of the world on his face, you know, his uh, his entire look is is shaped by a man who spends all of his time in, in, in cold water, you know, and you contrast that with the life of a tourist, you know, that is shaped by whimsy almost, you know, so that's at Cullen Beach. You know, and that's something we'll be working on over the next couple of years. I'm intending to go and visit uh, well, I've kind of got some things arranged to spend some time with some surfers along the coast. I'm also going to spend some time with addicts and Fraser Brown, take some pictures and try and show what that coast means and the fact that it's not a tourist spot, really. You know, so that then kind of leads us on, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're maybe thinking hopefully to something relevant, but that leads us on to the story of how we tell the story of our practice to clients, really, you know, so... You know, we, we tell that story through the material that we show them, you know, but more importantly in the conversations that we have, the manner, uh, the dynamic that we they set with our clients, you know, and you can't fake that. You know, we like to think a client will always know if you're genuine, you know, so we don't try to pretend that we uh, are a big practice, we're not, you know, um, we are slightly elusive, that's one way of, of, of putting it, really. We like to hide up in the hills and come out and do buildings and all those things are, are, are true. So it's an easy thing, you know, we start to tell the story of a place anytime you do a building, you know, and we understand what it means to put buildings in hospitable locations and more importantly, what it means to live in them as well. You know, we also want to tell a, sto a story of non corporateness you know, there's a domestic feeling even to our studio space deliberately. So, you know, and kind of combined with what it means to place things in the landscape and about contextualism, you know, which doesn't always mean hiding, you know, it, it could mean sticking out like a sore thumb. The idea is about appropriateness and response. Also being relatable, you know, that, that, that's Monty again, by the way. You know, the idea is that, that we, I think we bring an empathy to our work, that we understand what the clients are going through. We've been clients, you know. I think it's very, it's very easy to slip into a corporate thing that the clients are there to put, excuse me, to put food on your table. Whereas actually it's not. There are people going through things and, 
experience and things and you know, you're fortunate enough to have been asked to deliver a building within that and I think that that's something that we always take quite seriously and we communicate that we're a family business you know we were a, a newly, newly married couple when we set up you know it was a live work thing for us we love clients lives you know it's not uncommon to have our daughter interrupt a zoom call you know and I think that people can relate to all of that you know it's great that the world is becoming more understanding of these things generally you know but then it's a story of people, really. You know, that every project's a story of people. You know, that they make buildings, which are really cheesy, you know. But I think acknowledging that the other parts of a puzzle beyond designing and delivering a building, they enhance the story about it rather than dilute it, really. You know, and often the story's about place, you know, the wonderful locations we get to work in. Like, this is out in Noidart, where we're working our project at the moment. And I think also what we bring to our jobs I think we understand how inconsequential we are really in the midst of everything you know that you are placing a building a landscape as a dot within that landscape and I think it's, it's important that we understand that we can change the world in that thing we can only improve the things that we are working on but places are not in isolation you know that dogs define their world by smell but moles by touch humans by people you know that that's either ourselves or others you know stories are the most vivid when they allow us to partially conjure them ourselves, filling in the blanks from a human perspective. You know, so how how we try to put that into practice, you know, is that we make sure that we convey a message to potential clients as well. You know, it's a relationship that we want to build up with them, and it comes down slightly to how our story works. I'm not a big fan of marketing, you know, but there's a thing, story brand, which. We, uh, we found after we had already been doing it rather than the other way around, which, which was good, you know. So this was the exception of the rule. This is a, a marketing thing I can understand and relate to. You know, the idea that you have a character who, with a problem, meets a guide, they give them a plan, they do something and it works or it doesn't. And I think once you understand that, it can ruin it, most films that you've ever seen. For example, so this is a Star Wars example, you know, a character, Luke Skywalker with a problem, The Empire, meets a guide, Yoda, gives him a plan, trust the force, calls him to action, fight. And what happens? Success of Death Star is destroyed or failure, Darth Vader wins. You know, and once you actually know that, it's quite depressing to look for it in film. You'll see it in about 90% of the films you'll ever see. You know, so we didn't find this and then fit our practice to it. You know, we kind of did it organically. Then later we came across this and understand that this is something that we already do, really. So in a way, the client's the hero. You know, no one commissions a building because they want to be Robin. Everyone commissions a building because they want to be Batman. You know, so I think what we try to do is we identify what they want, you know, and we make that central to the story of how we're designing and delivering the building. That makes them central to the story, you know. We don't have any ego. I think that it's cheesy, you know, but it's true. You know, it's important that the client is in there. And they have a problem. You know, they want to build a house, for example, but they don't know how. The clients are desire-driven, but time poor for the most part. They're intelligent and capable, but they need our help. You know, they're, they're not people who, through our genius, we will bestow upon them a building, you know, which is the kind of architect ego model. You know, so they're, they're people that have a specific problem and it's a privilege to be asked to solve it because that allows us to do the thing that we want to do. Second and last Star Wars reference, you know, that the, the client meets a guide. The clients don't want heroes. They want a guide to help them achieve something not so that they can bring us something that we can achieve. Everyone sees things through the prism of themselves. I mean, you can't help it, including clients. And we want to be that guide. It's the last Star Wars reference, but it's not the last film reference. You know, the, the hero and the guide, Rocky, you know, is also one of my other favourite films, The Life Aquatic. One of the many films ruined for me by the story band framework, you know, about the idea of Steve Zizou and his son, you know, who's the hero, one's the hero and one's the guide. You know, and I think once you see that, you see it all the way through things. So we tell clients how we'll get them where they want to go. It's not only about the solution. People should enjoy the journey as well. It's not something that domestic clients get to do often, if ever again. You know, if you're lucky enough to do a building, most people do one. As a result, we're not just offering them the result, result excuse me, we're offering them the process as well. You know, I think we put clients in the middle of the project and you know, we call on them, put little liaise with them, we build trust with them. You know, that when we design a building, for example, we show them several options. We want to get their feedback and we want to feed that in. And then what comes from that is a further option that encapsulates everything that they were keen on and that we were keen on. But 
you know, it, it gives them a real role in steering the ship, which I think is, if you're brave enough to embrace it, is a really exciting way to work. And then obviously, so they avoid failure. I, I did a Google search for the worst designed house in the world. So I'm not picking on this house. Google's picking on this house. You know, but it's important to let people see what's at stake if things don't go well for them. But then hopefully also, you know, show them uh, what happens if it, if it does go well for them. You know, so make sure clients understand how we can help them get where they want to be. But also what it's going to look like at the end. You know, it's not, it's not just about that end result, but it's about the journey as well. Not as bad as it sounds, telling stories to clients, but what I really mean is some projects, you know, so... Took a little bit about a lower to look good project. So one, a character, a client, you know, so Brian and Jill, uh, one of them is a senior partner in a, an international consultancy firm, and the other one's a former software developer. So one American, one Scottish. Living in London, big family in Scotland. I had a second home near Aviemore that the whole family used, but it was compulsory purchase for the E9 upgrade. And what they wanted to do was create a second home, but it's actually not just for their family, it's for their family in terms of 20 odd people, but actually smaller family groups use it as well. You know, and then the idea is that it won't be a second home in the future, it'll be where they live. So they had a problem, you know, really. So just outside Aviemore, there's an existing house with an adjacent steading. It's a lovely thing, or it was a lovely thing, as I'll show you in a little minute, but it has some real difficulties about it as well. You know, so they wanted to create a house, let's say, for their wider family could gather from the US and from the UK, you know, and, and they'll end up living there, you know, as the children get older. And the original brief was to reuse the existing steading, but this presented a lot of challenges. You know, it was six metres away from the house, it was three metres lower. And it, the site itself is tucked away, it's a hidden kind of context. It's a island of privately owned land, kind of in Rothney Marcus estate. So anecdotally, uh, We've kind of been told that the house was gifted to a tenant farmer who came back from the First World War just to cycle in with my 1917 reference. You know, and that's why it's one of the only privately owned bits of land. So there was the existing house on the right hand side, and then there was the steading on the left. Now, that steading, unfortunately, was made of some bits of stone, some bits of block, some bits of falling down. There was bits you could put your arm through it. It was really poorly constructed. You know, and like I said, where it sits presented some real difficulties as well. So you can see the house kind of visible there in the context of Rothy Marcus. So you can't actually, where we put the extension project I'm going to show you, you can't really see from the public realm at all. And then step, step three of the story is they meet a guide. I'm not going to talk about this for every project. I'll just do step three just for this one. You know, so how we meet clients is a long story, which I won't go into, but it's primarily about empathy, you know, establishing common values, things that we like, hints at what type of people we are, and vice versa. You know, it's a non-project uh, related posts on social media. Aren't, excuse me, aren't just there as further. They're a way to give clients visual cues as to what kind of practice and people we are, and an attempt to attract a counterpoint in a client. You know, so like I say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't repeat this on other jobs, but for example, it might be ceramics, nice objects. It might be Leica cameras, which are my own personal obsession. You know, it might be, a, you know, an idea about certain books that we read or about lighting that we like. You know, like it, it doesn't matter. You, you, you're trying to find an affinity with people and for them to find an affinity with you. So four, you know, he gives them a plan and th this track into the site became the starting point for the whole design process for us. At the moment, the, the garage door you can see there, it blocks the views of the Spey Valley beyond. But that's, a, as you walk into the site, it's a really interesting kind of vista. You get this kind of little tunnel through the trees and it became interesting to us. We wanted to open up that view that's framed by the trees, but we also thought, could we keep the bulk of the building hidden behind the existing foliage. So then it became about the idea of the track and the building being supported across it, you know, and, and that came pretty quickly. You know, it, it kind of was a starting point for the design process. It was like a simple descriptive reaction to visiting the site. The idea of like cantilevering a barn light volume above a, a heavy plinth that we make, you know, using the existing stone and creating a clear division between the old and the new, or the farmhouse and the new part with a frameless light touch glass in between. And we started to think about the idea of sh should the, the barn 
float above the plinth or should it be anchored in some way, perhaps the other side of that, uh, the gap that you see through the trees. So rather than just be a hole through the trees, we would then create another layer to the hole. So we would create something on each side too, that you could look underneath. And, and the kind of stages for that came, you know, you have an existing steading, you take off its roof, you create a plinth and you put a building on top of it. And that allows you to have a consistent flow level across the extension and the old parts because you know, some of the members of this family, you know, they range from two to 82, really. You know, so I think trying to get everything on a single living level for most part uh, was really important to us. You know, so when you come in on that lower level, you know, which you'll see in the images, all you've got down there are garages and services. So that's not the main entrance. That's where you come if you have been out kayaking or mountain biking or you want to get down and put stuff in the laundry room. The main floor above, you know, you can have entered at that glass link and you turn left into the extension for social and right into the house for private. And then the, the plan becomes more private the further you move through it until you get down to the master bedroom, which is at the end. And it was that idea that it's a very simple, legible plan. You know, that I don't think there's anything groundbreaking about that, but not nor do I think that there actually has to be. Oh, sorry, excuse me. That just showed everything is shaded black. It was is the way it already was. So the thing is that I think when you're doing something that involves the degree of extension or renovation, if it's not broken, you don't have to fix it. So the bedrooms to the first floor are largely as they were, with the exception of a new stair coming up. And you can see there with the kind of column, the idea that we were creating a tunnel underneath the building again with that cantilever, which echoes the kind of tunnel that you see down through the trees. And that's just a simple section showing the kind of plinth below in the services and the idea of a visually lighter barn sitting above the plinth. And then step five of the process, which hopefully results in success. You, you, this picture is a bit closer in, but you can see that idea that we've kept that vista going right down underneath the building and that we've also framed it in the same way that the trees do. So I'll just chat. I'll just flick through some of these. We worked a lot on the job with, well, I mean, it was an embarrassment of riches really, but we worked with an excellent contractor, a great structural engineer, I know a really skillful blacksmith who made a lot of the, the blackened stainless steel uh, detailing throughout the house that we worked with. And whether that's inside, like with the way the balusters continue up to form the, the balustrade on the first floor, or even outside elements like uh, you know, kind of stainless steel that's pushed into the stone. The, the stone itself is actually from the same quarry as the stone used to build the original house. So the, the contractor managed to, it's been closed for years, but the contractor managed to get the big quarry company to allow it to be open so that they could go in and pick the stone from the same quarry face that the stone on the original house and the landscaping walls was from, allowing you to have a real kind of sense of continuity across the site. But mostly the thing with this house is, is about large south-facing uh, glazing bringing in heat but then actually a lot of the views are to the north, which is slightly counterintuitive. And you kind of look through it. It's the thing when the client had this old car, which you can see there, which is a, a 1960s Ford Falcon that had been his uh, grandparents. And he had that flown over from Idaho and keeps it at, at Aviemore and, uh, and uses it regularly. It's not just a showpiece. So the, another reason for the cantilever is we wanted the car to be able to sit underneath it when they're there so they don't have the hassle of putting it away every time in the summer. So it, that kind of became a little bit of a driver for it. Because again, that's something important to the client. And you can see some of that locally sourced stone on the right hand side there as well. And to the north side, which is on the terrace that you can see here, uh, most of the views are to that side. It looks up the Spade Valley. However, it's also cold and you lose a lot of heat there, etc. So uh, part of the reason for the covered terrace was actually to bring the facade away from the worst of the weather and give it a bit of protection, yeah, as well as creating a space that all of the living kitchen dining spaces open out onto that terrace as well. So it extends the rooms outside, uh, whether it's nice weather or not. People always think this balustrade is semi-opaque. That's frost because the photographer Gillian had been waiting for three days for the temperature to get above minus 15. So we just photographed it with the frost. But the idea is that there's these wonderful views north up the valley. 
And some of the rooms are about huge floor to ceiling views to and giving you everything. And some of the views, uh, some of the rooms are about very focused views. And it becomes about as you come into the master bedroom, that's the only window that you get that gives you that kind of slot view. And that's uh, exactly where the glass link is between the old and the new. And I'm just going to play a short film as well, just for a little minute. And th th this film, which I'll start, is, is actually made by another client of ours, who's a filmmaker, a, a chap called Ewan Robinson. And uh, that was a really interesting perspective, that you're, you're working with an existing client to make a film about a, a, a previous client's house. You know, so it was interesting to see how you looked at things, what was important about it. And what he didn't know, obviously, is that the whole time we were assessing what was important to him as well, so that that can carry forward into his own project. And then just to finish it uh, as a, a kind of cycle between the start, it starts with the client and it ends with the client. The client wanted a, a hidden toilet that you uh, open via a secret bookcase. And just to bring their personality into it, you actually pull the book, trump the art of the deal forward, and it triggers a wire mechanism that opens the hidden door. So I like to think it starts with the client and ends with the client. So then uh, we're going to talk about another project, which is called House for a Chemist, you know, so the a little bit about the people behind it, you know, so this is Michael, who's one half of the client. Michael would be embarrassed for me to say this, you know, but he's a genius, but, and I think that, that phrase is overused, you know, he's an industrial chemist, he's an inventor, he's one of the best clients anyone could ever ask for, really, you know, do you, when you've got clients that trust you, and they back you to the hill, and they allow you to do your best work. You know, when, uh, when COVID started, Michael got in touch with us and said, if we ever needed any help, not to do anything silly, that he wanted to help our business before, uh, you know, anything happened, not to borrow any money, not to do anything silly, always to come and speak to him. Uh, that it wasn't just about a building that we'd done for him, it was about a relationship that we're building. Uh, and that's something that we kind of strive to do with all of our clients if we can. And he had a problem, you know, in terms of every client does, that they had a lovely house, a Victorian villa that they'd owned for, for quite a while. Uh, on the Ayrshire coast, but their grown-up children had moved all over the world and they really wanted to make it a house for them, but also a place that now that they're settled, that the children could come back to as an anchor for the, for the whole family. And the brief was really about extending the Victorian villa, you know, and keeping it visually dominant. And it was about a whisper, not a shout, you know, and, and I'll explain a little bit you know, about that in a minute as I go on. 
So the site for the, the project is kind of in this no man's land between these outbuildings and the house, and this derelict outbuilding was on the site as well. And you can see here on the right hand side, there's a really nice neighbouring building. So it's a lovely piece of architecture. You know, it was uh, by Fleur Michelin, and it was shortlisted for the Manson Medal in 2019. But it represented everything that our client didn't want. And that doesn't mean it's bad, it means it's bad for our client. You know, so our brief was to create a whisper to contrast with its shout in a way. So the one thing about this site is the view. You know, you can't see it because it's murky there, actually, but the, the view tarant, you know, which we wanted to obscure uh, slightly oddly, which I'll, I'll, I'll go on about as we go on. And the other thing that really, that we kind of hinged upon was about materiality and contrast. The idea of using simple materials, which were less visually busy, sitting against the restored lock, uh, restored lock of big sandstone of the old house, which is a kind of distinctive orange uh, hue to it. And it was that idea that we would work with the existing topography as well, that as the site sloped down, so should our building and that it would be split level in a way, you know, allowing you on the higher level to look over the functions that happen on the lower level. And it became this idea about retaining one outbuilding and the house and the idea of this vista, and then you start to block it. And the idea is that you obscure it so that you can give it back to people at the time of your choosing as they move through the building. So the, the plan kind of fills in the space adjacent to the house, you know, which was quite a dank kind of space in the past. And you, you, can, you can either come into it on the upper level, which is kitchen. This is all one room, but it's level changes that differentiate it to create zones. And then you have this double-sided firewall that you move around, and that firewall goes inside, outside through the glass wall, but it also goes inside, outside through the roof. And the old house then starts to become slightly more cellular spaces, but how it connected to the, the new part was really important to us in, in creating this kind of vista from the bottom of the stairs through uh, you know, and trying to work with uh, the upper floor of this is, is consistent with floor level to the house. And then you step down in two ways down into the extension. So it's a single story, you know, it's kind of green roof. The idea is that from the hill and the town uh, behind it, you look over it and, uh, you know, you don't even really become aware that it's there. So again, we worked with the existing topography. There's a dotted line there, if you can see, which is the existing land. Stepping down to mirror it to try and remain unobtrusive, whilst also continuing the roof out at the same level, so that the spaces will change in volume. Yeah, and these were some of our initial concepts, which was about a wall of glass to the sea, really. You know, spaces stepping down with the land, that big open plan space, but it doesn't feel vast, it becomes divided. And then the building is, is really all about taking a back seat to place, you know, is... is I think that, that that's the hopefully successful results. I think all architects carry a big stick, you know, but it's important that you walk kind of softly with it sometimes, you know, that it's not about doing something that challenges what is important about this setting. You know, so the building itself is very quiet. I, you know, I think it, it's a simple contemporary form uh, and, and it sits there, really, the, the context looking the other way is, is, is spectacular. And it's not about trying to make something that someone walking along the beach will go look at that building. It's almost the opposite of that, really. And we wanted to take that space away, that, that, that view through the buildings. We wanted to block it and create a, a sense of enclosure to the rear and protected outside space that you don't get in, in kind of coastal locations like that. And uh, I, I'm going to have to show something from site, uh, you know, rather than a nice finish for photographs because we don't have anything for it. But this was Paul the joiner testing out how the sliding, the sliding fold and shutter worked. You know, so that idea that we can close off the back of the building completely and it creates a complete barrier to the view. But the idea is that you can open it up at your choosing and as you work through it. You know, so again, these are just some shots of showing how the, the external wall of the old house runs inside, outside. And then on the other side, you've got the black and stainless steel that also runs inside, outside. So the idea that the spaces are always between two things. And that just shows some of the detail. And again, really lucky to work with, with really good contractors and engineers and, and craftspeople you know, that, that you can bring together to do these things. And it's a simple space, really. It's a simple space that, that, that's made for that, you know, that, that, that's made for view. You know, but it was, it's really important that we respect the old house to us. So, I mean, even as you come through from the old house, we've lined the openings in black and stainless steel. Uh, which you can see just on the left of the image here. 
you know so you're aware of a threshold you're aware of a of a transition between old and new and nothing just runs into each other you know it has that kind of nice feeling that the the stone of the house is supporting the roof of the extension on that side and then it bleeds in and out the thing is that you know, the black and stainless steel goes up through the roof and it comes out through the through the glazed partition as well and it kind of helps define the spaces rather than it being one big industrial loft size space it then starts to become spaces that take a human scale you know and uh, that people you can see yourself inhabiting and, and it's little details you know that Again, we're lucky to, to work on this job with some with some great people. So we work with a, a kitchen company, Joseph French, who make everything bespoke, you know, and, and really will do anything for the client, you know. Like, so that became a piece of furniture, the island, you know, the idea that it's step, the topography and the, the floor level step around it. So on one side, it's kitchen unit height. On the other side, it's one and a half metres high. It becomes an item of furniture then. It was the same when you got to work with a company called Failk, who, who make bespoke, wonderful bespoke furniture, you know, with uh, it's kind of really interesting provenance of where the trees come from and how it's within their gift and to kind of uh, dry them and work with them and things over, over a period of years. And, and they designed this table for that space, you know, so the, the idea is that they'll never do another table like it. And I think that that's something that has allowed the client, you know, talking about that dynamic of how they take ownership of the project, even by the pieces of furniture that they're putting into it, they're able to feel as if they're steering that ship. But in, in the old house, what we actually did for the most part is we stripped it back to the stone. We insulated everything. Uh, the extension is of insulation values way in excess of the build rigs. And then we put in a ground source heat pump system that uh, powers the whole house. You know, so part of that was taking away the old sash and case windows and replacing them with the uh, uh, ones that look very similar and then downstairs I don't have actually have a shot of it we even had the stained glass unpicked from the old windows and then put in between the panes of the new modern units so it's actually a, a very warm house you know it, it, it costs far less to run the house in extension than it ever cost to run the, the the smaller house initially and it's trying to create kind of slightly restful spaces they're really simple the spaces in the old house they're about allowing the character of the house to come through uh, trying to keep bits of original kind of detailing and skirting and things that a lot of it had been ruined over the last 150 years and it was about finding out what was there and, and then getting moulds made so that we can replicate it. And then that, that just kind of shows the split level aspect of standing on the, the upper kitchen thing and how you get a, a, a certain view from the dining, a slightly different view from the living, but when you're up on that kitchen thing you have a view of the space more than anything. And it was just trying to create a bit of interest in, in a room that is uh, could become quite impersonal if you didn't. So now, I'm just going to speak about another couple of projects. I, I, I wouldn't take too much too much more of your time. So, so it's a job up at Park Bray, you know, that, that we had done a few years ago. You know, so the, the clients were a geologist and a, and a GP who had met in Greenland when one of them used to be part of an elite Danish military unit that patrolled Greenland with sled dogs. You know, and they now settled in Aberdeenshire, three children, and wanted to create a kind of forever home. And they had lived locally for a long time and had found this spot, uh, you know, that had several ruins, uh, the evidence of several ruined buildings with on it, uh, on it, sorry, uh, just near the back of Benahy. And the brief was really that it should be suitable for family life, but because one of them was a geologist, they were very interested in the ruins that were on the site and also any rocks that broke the surface. Excuse me. So, I mean, this actually isn't very clear on screen, but when assessing the site, we found no place where a building of this size could sit without disturbing existing rocks or sites, uh, sorry, or walls within the site. They look like real structures. Some of them are, are you know, 100 mil high, those walls. Some of them are less than 100 mil high. Uh, and it was, it was actually quite a manufactured landscape when you looked at it. You know, there had been numerous homesteads that were on that hill at one point. Uh, and you can just see a little, well, you can see some that maybe about 1.6 high at one point, but we're actually looking across some in clumps of grass, but you can't even really tell. And the idea became then, you know, we wanted to create a new kind of masonry wall on the site, and then it kind of supports the other bits of it. So if there's nowhere that's large enough for the building on the site, we wanted to create that new fin, that new piece of masonry. And the idea is it could support a larger building above it, 
that doesn't result in a large footprint scarring the site as much. And then we started to fill in underneath it, you know, which is where all the, the services and things for the house go. And in our first initial sketches, it was always about the idea of elevated living, about the clients being brought above the landscape, you know, and having a social space that kind of ran uh, all, all the way along a large space with an outside terrace that they would bleed out onto. And uh, the idea they always want to be outside, you know, the clients, look, look, they are always outside, you know, and they don't have to go downstairs, they can go onto the covered terrace and along to the end and access the land on the upper level. Uh, and it was also about creating spaces within a house for focus views, you know, not only big wide general ones, uh, you know, that, that idea that you would make a book nook that lines up with the, the arch on the top of Dunny Deer, uh, you know, that or... Uh, you would create a, a window seat that sits at this. There's a magnificent sycamore on the site, and it was the idea that you would create a treehouse seat within it. And it was about creating relationships between those open plan spaces and those smaller, more intimate moments, like window benches. So the plan became about a, a lower floor that's service spaces. You know, it's parking, it's a space to uh, for a gun safe and to hang game and all sorts of stuff, and also for, for, for a family to store sporting stuff. And it's where you enter primarily, you drive underneath the building. And you come up uh, into uh, kind of a large social space that, again, is divided by the stair in the middle, which is a dwarf wall and which is desks and things around it as well. And then a kind of fin wall that creates slightly more private spaces to the, to the right hand side of the plan as you look at it. And one end that is about smaller bedrooms, deliberately so the client wanted didn't want palatial bedrooms, they wanted uh, kind of monastic bedrooms, I think was the phrase in their quote, uh, and the idea that they would put more of their time, effort and money into the social spaces of the house. And it's kind of shows how it sits in the landscape. So the, the existing land kind of ran like that, you know, so we tried to kind of fit within it. And again, which hopefully kind of results in success. So the, the drive up to it lines up with that magnificent sycamore, which you can see kind of underneath the house there. There's, there's a very dog theme to, to my lectures, it seems. Uh, so the materials palette was about, uh, it, it's unpainted timber that's got CU on it. You know, so it's a thing that makes it all weather the same, regardless of what direction it faces. And then it has a heavy plinth of smoked uh, clay bricks you know, which we'd originally looked at stone, but the planners were really happy with the clay bricks because every one of them is different. Some of them are very ribbon surface, some are very smooth. So it's actually, it's not a jarring thing to see in the landscape. And we continued that fin wall again, inside, outside, which is something we're quite interested in in our projects, that idea of kind of elements that tie things together. And we ended up with a larger building than the footprint allowed, you know, that, that, that space within the site that didn't have ruin on it. And you have kind of these wide reaching views, kind of from the main social spaces, kind of towards the back of Benahee and things. But at the same time, it's those more focused areas, you know, so that's a treehouse seat with the magnificent sycamore. We've also got places where there's integrated desks for homework that's adjacent to the kitchen, for example, so that there can be numerous members of the family all doing things, not needing to all be in each other's uh, on each other's toes, but within the same space. And you can see there the kind of colours of the clay brick versus the kind of colours of the old house, the, the, the ruin that we kind of consolidated on the site. You can see that they have the same kind of language colour-wise in the landscape. And that's the fin wall again, which is really an inhabited wall, you know, so it's got storage in it, it's got pocket doors, it's got a double-sided stove. You know, and uh, it's something that kind of is a unifying element through the building. And uh, I get more focused views. So that's actually the arch on the top of Dunny Deer there. So the idea that the, the rear of the house has focused views and the front of the house has general views. You know, so moving along that again, you have a kind of book line snug awaiting a cushion. I notice in that picture, you know, which actually, if, if you sit there, it lines up uh, kind of your head lines up with Dunny Deer as well from this side. And that was something that we were quite interested in. It's not just about, it's really easy to say there's a wonderful landscape, here's a big glass, look at it. But it's sometimes it can be quite interesting to have those more little focused snippets. Not everyone agrees though. There's an example of finding just the right clients. We received this email randomly, uh, you know, a couple of years after the project was finished by someone that just wanted to make sure that we knew how much they hated it and how much they really didn't like us either. 
and how uh, we don't understand the values of, of uh, North East Scotland, even though we've lived here for quite a long time now. So you can't please all the people all the time. You know, so that's such a perfect example of how it's really important to find the right people for you to allow you to do what you want to do. And then the last project I'm going to speak about is actually a, a extension, but mostly a renovation and a retrofit that we did in Aberdeenshire. So the, the character uh, in this, you know, the client was two young professionals who were living in South Korea at the time, and they wanted to come back to Scotland and uh, create a home because they you know, wanted to have a family. And they were looking for something that had a blend of contemporary and traditional, but they had a really tight budget, you know, and, and they found this house on a wonderful spot, but, you know, it's fair to say it had seen some better days. So it was about 30 minutes west of town. The original cottage and buyer with character, but then there was previous extensions that were of low quality, poorly considered and constructed. And it, it's something, it's a far more difficult problem than a vacant site for a house. So that, that was the original extension. It was just clad in, in, in kind of slate. It's uh, angular walls, which just leak all over the place. And it, it wasn't a layout that worked or anything either. And our, our brief, uh, as we walked out with them, became about upgrading and extending that house, keeping a very tight grip on spend and greatly increasing the thermal performance of the house, you know, while reducing energy usage and things as well. So these were the existing plans. So you can see that the, the cottage on the right-hand side, the stable, uh, the buyer on the left-hand side, and the kind of non-original extension. And what we wanted to do was make more of a, of a courtyard entrance. So make it that when you come into that, you're protected from the weather. And the kind of yellow zone, as you can see, it there addresses you where you come in and you've got uh, kind of storage, et cetera. And the whole of the old cottage became kitchen family room. But it doesn't look towards Benahy yet. Kind of, we, we made that address a private kitchen garden on one side. And then social spaces are about looking uh, towards Benahy from the other side now. The, the, these projects mirror each other, the last two. And then the, the bedroom block you know, became about a different view to the garden. And it also became about looking to the west, which none of the other spaces do. And it really, a lot of it is there's a high degree of retrofit, uh, reducing the kind of embodied CO2 at the end result. But it's also about making the most of the elements that are already on site. I mean, everything's shown there that shady black or red uh, was already existing. So it's really about putting an insulation and cladding jacket around the existing building. The only extension is there, you know, which is, uh, you know, I think it's about five metres square. You know, so apart from that, we wanted to create spaces that brought out the character and the volume of the original buildings. So we removed the first floor over the original cottage, which was tiny anyway, creating a, a volume that you don't expect inside an old cottage building. And, it's, and as I said earlier, that addresses the garden. And in the existing extension, we kind of swept away the internal walls and created a central pod, you know, that houses the bathroom which, and the stove and things on one side and, and coat storage on the other. And that helps create a degree of separation between the social spaces and the entrance courtyard. And that kind of defines the extent of where those social spaces beyond it sit. So again, you can see everything red was existing. So we we're kind of working with the existing structure, but making it thermally efficient. And slotting that pod bathroom in the middle, which like I say, kind of becomes that defining thing between social and entrance. And then just to try to bring it kind of in a cycle again, that, that first image looking into that courtyard where you had the kind of stromash of buildings kind of run into each other. And we wanted to make something quite legible of what, what is newer and, and, and what is old. So th these are all existing opening widths that we worked with so that we didn't make any new openings in the masonry on that side. And again, like, like quite a lot of our projects, it sits quietly, really. I, I don't think we feel the need to be shouting. Uh, within the landscape. I mean, Upper Park Bay, for example, is something where it is far more noticeable in the landscape because that's what we deemed appropriate. Whereas in this instance, it's actually about letting the character of the traditional buildings kind of stand as well. You can see there at, at the bottom where we kind of had the restored and uh, repointed and things, granite plinth, before we then uh, clad the extension above it. So it is largely a retrofit project, really, but it's finding ways to do that creatively and that make a big difference to the performance of the building. So that, that whole cottage then became a kitchen and family room with glazing that opens out onto a kind of smaller kitchen garden space. And the pod in the middle, 
then obviously became this idea that if you go into a room that's obviously in the middle, you expect it to be dark and horrible. So obviously we wanted to try to confound that by creating this object, which has a stove and things and it's very functional, but at the same time within it is something slightly hidden and interesting. And these are just some examples of the, the kind of space that show, the, I think, the human elements of it that make it more successful. And then just to bring it through to a kind of cycle, you know, I wanted to remind you all that the universe is still going to end, even though I've told you this story for a little while. So thanks very much.